in the northern part of then Zaire, now DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. This is about 50 kilometers north of the Congo River. And you can see the dirt road that's going through the mission and into the tropical rainforest. Um, at the mission, on the left-hand side of the road, you're seeing the hospital complex and on the right, the school. And it was in this hospital that the first outbreak of Ebola ever occurred. Now this outbreak came to the attention of the authorities in Kinshasa, the capital of DRC, uh, when it was reported that this was in a mission, there was an outbreak in a mission hospital that had killed three sisters and one father. And so uh, Jean-Jacques Moyembe, who was a virologist and a medical doctor in Kinshasa, went up to the outbreak site and he thought it was um, yellow fever and he took some liver specimens and he also took one of the sisters, the only surviving sister, down to Kinshasa to the hospital there. And she was hospitalized there. He collected bloods from her and sent those bloods to CDC in Atlanta where I was working to the Royal Tropical Institute in Antwerp and to Porton Down in the United Kingdom. And from those specimens, an electron microscopy showed that this was a filiform virus. And it was thought at that time to be the Marburg virus. However, uh, Dr. Patricia Webb, a virologist from the UK working at CDC, uh, did some studies in vitro, in vivo, in vitro, sorry and actually showed that this was a new virus and the virus was later named the Ebola virus. Now this is the outpatient record at the hospital where the first outbreak occurred in Yambuku and circled in green is a patient called Makilo Albeta. And he was from Yandangi, which was five kilometers away from the mission, but he was actually the headmaster at the school in the mission. And he presented to the clinic with epistaxis, nosebleeds, and dysentery, diarrheal disease. He was thought to have um, malaria, and he was treated with one of these four syringes and one of these two needles, which were not being sterilized between use in that outpatient department. Now, what you see is also some other equipment because the outpatient department alternated equipment between the outpatients and the maternity so that whenever there was a delivery, all of this equipment went into the maternity, and this is the maternity at that hospital in Yambuku. Well, an outbreak occurred beginning in women who were delivering in the hospital, but then spreading to health workers, to their contacts, and the transmission was determined to have been either by needle and syringe or by close contact. Now, the hospital closed on the 18th of October, and actually the international teams that arrived didn't arrive until after the hospital was closed. And as you can see, the outbreak ended. The outbreak had actually ended by the time the teams got there. We got there, but the outbreak was over. But investigation suggested that this was the means of transmission. There were actually 318 cases when community surveys were done and 280 deaths. And this was the first known outbreak of Ebola with a case fatality rate of 88%. So it was clear that this was a nosocomially caused outbreak caused by unsterilized needles and syringes. This is the second outbreak just, uh, just one year later in Tandala Zaire, which was about 100 kilometers to the west of Yambuku. Now, this hospital was run by an American missionary doctor who had actually gone to Yambuku and helped with the outbreak investigation and control there. And so the Dr. Cairns, who was this doctor, had seen Ebola. He knew what it looked like. And when a patient was admitted to his hospital with this in disease, he immediately isolated the patient. No, something's happened to my, okay. This was one case, she died. There were no further cases in the hospital, but her sister fit the possible case definition. She was still at home and she survived. So this showed that isolation could prevent spread within a hospital if it was done in the proper way. 
And so with Tom Cairns, there was a research project set up, an active surveillance project, five years between 1981 and 1985. And you can see Tandala in the middle of the dark circle. And then the other dark circles are where there were health workers in communities, volunteers, who were taught what Ebola looked like. And when Ebola occurred, they were to immediately isolate the patient in the household and report to the mission hospital in Tandala. When Tom Cairns went, collected the patient, put it in the hospital, isolated the patient, and filled in a standard questionnaire. During this period of time, there were actually 98 people who had possible clinical or probable disease. And of those, um, 21 appeared to have Ebola. Their bloods were then examined in the laboratory at CDC, and they were shown to have had Ebola infection. So we learned a little bit more from this. We learned that isolation of patients actually prevents outbreaks and that Ebola emerges periodically in nature. What is believed to happen is that it is so virulent that people soon learn to stay away from that person who's sick and the outbreaks burn themselves out when they occur. And this has been shown to have occurred in the first outbreak in 1976, because the reason it stopped was the hospital was closed, but also the community members began to just abandon their community of fellows who became sick because they were afraid that they would get the same type of illness as that person. So what we learned between 1976 and, it should be 19, what we learned between 1976 and 1985 was that Ebola virus emerges from nature periodically. But if patients are rapidly detected and isolated, outbreaks can be prevented. We also learned that failed infection prevention and control in health facilities amplifies transmission to outbreaks as occurred in the first outbreak. And we know that Ebola is associated and is transmitted by unsterilized needles and by hospital equipment in close contact with infected persons. So we understood a lot about Ebola by 1985 from the research, field research, and the outbreak investigations that have occurred. But then in 1995, there was another outbreak of Ebola in DRC. And this was not, again, on the Congo River, but it was in a different part of, of DRC. And this was, again, in a missionary hospital. And in this hospital, there were Italian sisters, and many of them became sick and died. And this outbreak, like the previous outbreak in DRC, had been caused by amplification of infection in hospital with poorly managed infection prevention and control. The outbreak actually began in January, it's believed, in a person who was working in the rainforest making charcoal. He infected a few people in his household and they infected other people in a slow chain of transmission until March 7th when one of those people was admitted to the hospital and an explosive outbreak occurred when hospital workers were infected, then non-hospital healthcare workers and their families. An outbreak of 315 cases, 250 deaths, a case fatality rate of 80%. But we did learn quite a bit more in this outbreak. And there's Jean-Jacques Moyembe in the white coat on the right, the discoverer of the Ebola virus. He's the first one who saw this virus in Yambuku in 1976, when he took a patient back to Kinshasa and isolated her and collected her bloods. But Moyembe um, was, is a very clever epidemiologist. And in the outbreak in DRC, it was soon learned in, in Kikwit, rather, that dead bodies were very infectious. And so the Red Cross volunteers were dressed in protective clothing. There were messages not to uh, touch patients or dead bodies. And Moyembe actually um, developed a way of dealing with communities so that he could get their involvement immediately. And what Moyembe did and what he still does at the age of 78 when he goes to outbreaks is the first thing he does is to call together the village chiefs. He talks with them in their language, says that this is a very serious outbreak. It's being caused by evil spirits who are in those people who are sick. 
And if you touch those people or their dead bodies, those evil spirits will come to you and you will become sick as well. With those simple messages, he engages villages to participate in outbreak containment and the outbreaks are rapidly stopped in DRC in most instances. So by 1995, we had learned that funerals with touching of the dead transmit infection and community participation and understanding stops transmission. So we knew a lot. We knew all we needed to know by 1995, except we didn't know one thing. And that was we didn't know where this virus was hiding in nature, where was the reservoir. And so in fact, at all three of these outbreaks, there were animal uh, researchers who came in, collected animals, collected their organs in liquid nitrogen, transmitted them back, transferred them back to labs, but were never able to find the virus. Here's how there was random collection at outbreak sites at all the different outbreaks um, when they occurred. But, in 1990, in 1990 um, there was actually um, a, more information that became available because during studies of pygmies in Congo Basin, who lived in the same Congo Basin as Tandala and Yambuku, um, it was decided, we were doing studies with yaws, and it was decided that because these pygmies lived in nature, and because they were exposed to animals on a regular basis, we would see if in fact they had antibody to Ebola. And in fact, about 18% of the pygmy adults had antibody to Ebola. And it turned out these were mostly the hunters, the people who went out and hunted. So using good logical sense and a hypothesis, it was decided to do some search for the virus in animals that these pygmies were collecting, understanding that pygmies were being infected with the Ebola virus or a similar virus. And so for a two week period, there was a collection of specimens, organs and blood from animals that the pygmies collected every morning and brought in. They were then harvested, their organs harvested. Experts from the Smithsonian Institute identified the animals. They were photographed and then given back to the pygmies for their food, and the studies went on. And during that, those studies, actually, they found strong positive Ebola antibody in a flying squirrel. And so there was a request to go back and search for more flying squirrels, although this, um, me this message arrived after the outbreaks, after the studies had been completed. And so it was very difficult to get back. But these were the flying squirrels that were collected during that period. And these squirrels had Ebola antibody, which suggested that they could have been infected. Then there was an outbreak in 1992 in the Thai forest in Cote d'Ivoire in West Africa. And that outbreak was not in humans. It was in chimpanzees. And here are some of the dead chimpanzees that occurred. In fact, this forest was the site of an anthropological study by a researcher from Zurich, Switzerland, who had a colony of over 40 chimpanzees that he had been following for 20 years. All of a sudden, they started to die. And he called in a veterinarian from the Tropical Institute in Basel in Switzerland to help understand why they were dying. And during the autopsies that this person performed early on, uh, she actually became sick with a fever. She was doing autopsy, she found that many of the monkeys and other animals were in, were filled with blood in their abdominal cavities, but she herself became sick with symptoms and was immediately evacuated back to Zurich or Basel, where she was hospitalized. And this shows you her hospital course. She survived. It wasn't known she had Ebola when she was admitted to the hospital, but this was her hospital course. She recovered with good care, good hydration, and she had been isolated, so there were no further cases. And it wasn't known what had really been her illness until about four months later, when a specimen that had been collected from her was analyzed at the Institute Pasteur and shown to have the Ebola virus. So looking at this, you can see why it's so difficult to identify Ebola early on and why health workers do get infected. 
because they have fever, headache, myalgia, chills, which could be anything. Then sometimes they get better, but then they go on to get seriously ill. And that's when it's clearly class, classical Ebola. Then there was another outbreak in, um, in Makuku in Gabon in 1996. And this occurred in a butchered fresh bed, freshly found, in 19 index cases, sorry, who found and butchered a freshly dead chimpanzee. They had been out hunting. They came across a chimpanzee that had just died and they figured, well, we'll butcher this. They had seen it actually in its agonal phase and they say, we'll butcher this and take it home. Well, this chimpanzee obviously died of Ebola because these 19 index cases all became infected with Ebola. 18 family members and health workers got infected, but there was minimal onward transmission because they had excellent infection control in their hospital. And the outbreak had a case fatality rate of 70%, the Ebola virus from West Africa, from DRC. So it was known by this time that uh, other animals could carry the Ebola virus and could become infected, but they had the same fate as humans. Non-human primates died from infection, so we're probably not the reservoir. So then, having been at many of these outbreak sites and trying to identify the reservoir of Ebola virus, Bob Swanepoel in South Africa, in the viral laboratory there, decided that he would reverse the process. He would take into his laboratories animals that were thought to be um, um, possible reservoirs for the Ebola virus, and he would infect them in his laboratory and see if he was able to infect one of these animals that could survive infection and live. And here's Bob, he did find that a fruit bat, not this bat, but fruit bats in general, were able to carry the virus and didn't become sick in his laboratory. Then there were studies in West Africa, in um, Franceville in Gabon, where there was a viral research center, and they began to study bats, and they found in three bat species that in their guano, in their excretory material, there was actually, in their intestinal tract, there were actually fragments of the Ebola virus. But they were never able to isolate a living virus from bats, and nobody has been able to do that yet. But it's assumed that bats are the likely reservoir of Ebola, as you know. And it's thought that bats can either infect humans directly or humans indirectly through another animal that's purchased in a market, taken to home, and then butchered in the, in the home of that person. And then, of course, came the West Africa outbreaks in 2014 to 2015. And these outbreaks, again, were outbreaks which were highly lethal for health workers and unfortunately infected health workers transmitted the infection to others in the hospitals, to their families, and drove this outbreak um, until communities got involved and the outbreaks were stopped. But during this same period of time, my colleague Jean-Jacques Moyembe, then about 70 years old, was up in, B up in uh, Boande in DRC because there was another outbreak there. But he stopped that outbreak very rapidly. But even so, you can see that eight health workers got infected in this outbreak. This was an outbreak when a woman had been given a live animal by her husband, or a recently killed animal by her husband who was a hunter. She butchered that animal. She became sick. One of her sons became sick. She went to the health facility, health workers became infected, as did family members of those health workers. But as I said, the outbreak was rapidly stopped. A classic outbreak of Ebola, where health workers amplify transmission. And here you can see that outbreak, very short, and it was contained. Here's the uh, outbreak in West Africa. And this shows you that funerals at the bottom were a very major source of infection. And in addition, at the top, it shows you that people were transmitting from person to person as well, many of those um, in the hospital setting. And so Ebola, what we've learned. We've learned that Ebola emerges from nature periodically, failed infection prevention and control amplifies transmission to outbreaks, needles and syringes, hospital equipment, very important. Funerals are important. 
community participation extremely important and bats are the likely reservoir. So what's the future in the next few minutes? Well, as you know, we have a vaccine and this vaccine was not developed because people were concerned about the health of Africans. I have to be clear that this vaccine was developed in the United States and Canada, and it was developed because they were afraid that Ebola virus would be used as a bioterrorist weapon. And the vaccine just happened to be available when the West Africa, fortunately, when the West African outbreak occurred. This outbreak is now shown to be effective. It must be kept at minus 60. These are the containers that are used in the field. And here's how the vaccine is given. And the question is now, how can this vaccine be best used? Is it best used at the time of an outbreak in ring vaccination, which is what's going on now in DRC and in Gabon, where the two outbreaks are occurring? Or should it be used to vaccinate primary responders or healthcare workers throughout the Ebola belt in Africa to prevent amplification of transmission? A whole lot to be understood. But this will be understood eventually if the vaccine continues to be made available to, uh, for use for humanitarian purposes. And in addition, we now have Imazeb, which is monoclonal antibody treatment, which is now also being used both in DRC and Gabon, uh, in, and um, in West Africa, in, in uh, um, Guinea, as an attempt to um, treat infections and to prevent with vaccines. So that's what I had to say, Isabel, today. Um, I hope it's been useful and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, David. That was a very comprehensive and very interesting overlook of Ebola. Um, I thought I could start off with a question um, and just see if anyone else has any. I guess, firstly, why do we think that there's outbreaks of Ebola in Africa, sort of in the tropical region of Africa rather than tropical regions in other parts of the world like Southeast Asia or um, South America? Well, that's a good question. And Isabel, as you might know, there is an Ebola virus in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. That virus is called the Reston virus. And it was first isolated in monkeys, laboratory monkeys in the United States that became sick from monkeys that came in from the Philippines. And they were able to identify the Ebola virus reston strain in those, gym, in those monkeys. But the, and they did infect some of the workers, but the workers became very mildly ill. And then there was another outbreak um, in, of Ebola uh, uh, virus reston in the Philippines, in, um, in the Philippines in pig farmers. And pig, pigs were thought to have become infected from fruit bats and they then infected humans and that outbreak occurred. There were a few deaths, but it was rapidly stopped. So there is Ebola outside Africa in the Philippines, but it's a very mild Ebola virus compared to those in Africa. Thank you. Um, I've got another question. Oh, well, a question. Uh, what is the general perception on the Ebola vaccine by the population that have suffered from previous outbreaks? And are there any anti-vax movements? Yes, in fact, there are the same problems that there are anywhere else. There are people who don't want vaccinations, and there are people who do want them. Uh, it was very difficult in the West, in the West, in the Eastern DRC outbreak, which was a protracted outbreak for a year and a half, because the vaccine by many people was said to be coming from the government, which they didn't trust, and so they didn't trust the vaccine. Right now, in Guinea and in DRC. I understand that the vaccine is being used very effectively and there is no resistance at present to that vaccine. Thank you. So I think we're aware that Ebola has ar arisen as a result of sort of an increased um, human animal interface, especially well in Africa, this is seen like you use their lifestyle. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for innovations or technologies to sort of tackle this like outbreaks and spreads of Ebola? Can they change their lifestyle or would that be sort of forcing westernization on them? Well, I doubt that you can convince the Africans to change their lifestyle. But what you can do is figure out how you can innovate correctly to get infection prevention and control established in health facilities in West Africa. Because if there were good infection prevention and control, there would not be massive Ebola outbreaks because 
the transmission is amplified in hospital settings. So the innovation is to try to develop a means of convincing health workers who many times don't even have electricity or water in their health facilities, how to prevent infections. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot that could be innovated. And there's a, but this takes innovation working with the people in those countries, not sitting in a laboratory in the North. The innovation has developed vaccines and antibodies. Now it's time to really address the cause of these infections and prevent them at the source. And that cause is um, innovation in infection prevention and control in hospitals. But you can also try to figure out, innovate, how Africans can better understand the risks when they are in close contact with wild animals, when they're in the market or when they're butchering animals, that they are at a risk of possibly being infected. So there are some innovations to do, but it's very difficult. Nobody has succeeded yet in the last 50 years since we've known about Ebola to prevent outbreaks by good infection prevention and control. Thank you. And I guess a um, final question would be, um, why do you think we're struggling to sort of pinpoint, identify this definitive animal reservoir of Ebola? Well, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, really, isn't it? But I think with outbreaks becoming more frequent, it looks like what's happened is that this virus is spreading more rapidly in the animals. And so it's very likely that animal studies in the future might identify that reservoir in nature. But really, what will that do? The only thing it will do is tell people to stay away from bats. And as you know, in parts of Africa, bats are eaten for protein. And so that might be one lesson that could be learned. But what's more important is to understand the behaviors that lead people to get infected and try to let them understand how not to be infected. Thank you very much, David. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pass you back to Andrea now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heyman and uh, Israel. Um, well, now we are going to move to a different topic, but uh, without leaving neglected tropical diseases. To speak about uh, snake bite and venomation, uh, we are delighted to be joined by Professor David Worrell, who is uh, Emeritus Professor of Tropical Medicine, former head uh, Nuffield Department of Clinical Med Medicine and Honorary Fellow of St. Cross College at the University of Oxford. He's also a medical advisor for the Hamish Oxton Foundation, who, which philanthropically support causes related to health, heritage and music. Professor Worrell, the virtual uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea. I'll share my screen now. Can I assume that everyone can see the uh, screen? Yep, yeah, it's perfect. Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, excellent meeting. Uh, over the last few years, uh, snake bite has emerged from obscurity, from denial, even from derision, to being recognized as possibly the most neglected of all neglected tropical diseases. And I'd like to give you some background to this uh, neglected condition of tropical countries. First of all, probably the most compelling reason for being interested in snake bite, uh, what a burden of global human suffering does it exact? Uh, these are the best estimates we have for deaths from snake bite in each of the continents. You'll see there are very few in Europe, um, about 4,000 in the Americas, mainly in Latin America. Africa is the big unknown because there are countries, for example, like uh, DRC, which David Heyman's been talking about, where we have virtually no data at all about snake bite, which is highly populated and has many venomous snakes. Uh, Asia seems to be the most obvious focus of snake bite worldwide at the moment, and the island of New Guinea also has uh, quite a lot of deaths. It's important to realize that uh, although these figures for mortality are pretty bad, for every person lucky enough to uh, survive snake bite, perhaps 400,000 a year, and this is a highly suspect and not confirmed figure, uh, have to live with physical or psychological consequences for the rest of their lives. When we think about snake bite, historically, India has always been the snake bite capital of the world. Uh, enormous 
numbers of cases, enormous accumulation of skill and experience on the part of Indian doctors, whether they be Ayurvedic traditional therapists or um, uh, West, practitioners of Western medicine. And I want to focus on India just for a few minutes because we have the best data on the real burden of human mortality from snake bite from, from India. And this comes from the so-called Million Death Study, which was a meticulously designed community-based survey, which um, covered the entire country. And it was possible from this survey to um, uh, make a direct estimate of the number of deaths in each of the states. So you can see the largest number, 9,000 a year in Uttar Pradesh and uh, some of the other high burden states as well. This um, study has been published in two papers, the first one in 2011, the second more recently. The results really quite staggering. Over the 20 year period covered by the survey and its projections, that's 2000 to 2019, no fewer than 1.2 million people died of snake bite in India. This amounts to an average of about 58,000 deaths per year. 28% of these deaths were in children. And to put it in proportion, this was one snake bite death for every maternal death in India and for every two HIV AIDS deaths. Some of the risk factors of snake bite are illustrated here. These are all to do with particular occupations and activities and environmental exposures. So you can see that agriculture predominates. So here are some rice farmers in Myanmar. They're highly vulnerable. And even fishermen, hand fishermen, uh, are vulnerable to snake, uh, sea snake bites. And indigenous people, such as this Warani Indian in uh, Ecuador, because of their exposure in a very snake-infested uh, infested environment, are also extremely vulnerable. Climatic extremes like uh, flooding will flush snakes out of, the, of their burrows. And of course, snakes and humans tend to occupy diminishing areas of dry land. So this Indian lady has found a very large um, female Russell's viper sharing her hut with her. And even when you're asleep at night uh, on the floor of your dwelling in parts of South Asia, uh, you're not protected from snakes because night prowling crates um, may be attracted into your dwelling in pursuit of their natural prey. And if you roll over in your sleep, you may trap one of these crates and be bitten. And the uh, answer to that, of course, is to sleep under a mosquito net, which is highly recommended for other reasons. But the if the mosquito net is well tucked in under your bed mat, you may be protected from this real nightmare of, of, uh, of the dark, the hours of darkness in South Asia. Well, modern science has um, given us an enormous insight into the complexity of snake venoms, from thinking originally that it might be just one or two important toxins or poisons, a bit like strychnine or arsenic. We now realize that the venom of each species of snake contains probably hundreds of different toxic proteins and polypeptides. And um, this has been enabled, this uh, understanding has been made possible through modern techniques such as reverse chromatography and um, uh, the proteomics applied to venoms uh, known as venomics. And uh, these techniques allow us to have a pretty comprehensive view of all the components of these highly complicated venoms. As you can see here, uh, displayed in this uh, graphic form, uh, each of these segments applies to one of the key uh, protein families. So the principal protein families in snake venoms, first of all, phospholipase is A2, nearly always the most abundant metalloproteases, serine proteases, which have a particular role in promoting blood clotting, three-finger toxins, which can be both neurotoxic and cytotoxic, and cysteine-rich secretory proteins, 
L-amino acid oxidases, uh, kunitz type peptides, C-type lectins, disintegrins, and even natriuretic peptides. And I'd like to go through now the, the main effects of snake venoms in the human victim of snake bite uh, to try and relate <clears throat> these uh, important causes of both mortality and morbidity uh, to the particular toxins involved. <clears throat> so these are the key features. First of all, <clears throat> cardiovascular failure resulting in a fall in blood pressure and shock bleeding or blockage of arteries by uh, clots or damage to small blood vessels, microangiopathy. <clears throat> then there's paralysis, uh, eventually leading to respiratory paralysis and respiratory failure or respiratory obstruction, kidney damage, generalized breakdown of skeletal muscle, technical term is rhabdomyolysis, and the main cause of morbidity, physical uh, morbidity after snake bite in survivors, the consequences of local tissue necrosis by the snake venom toxins normally involved in digesting the snake's prey that turned on the victim's tissues can um, require surgical intervention or even amputation of a gangrenous extremity. So I'd like to go through these one by one, starting with uh, cardiovascular failure, this is fall in blood pressure or shock. And here is a typical victim of uh, Russell's viper bite in Myanmar. This is a, a snake, it is a, um, a rice farmer I looked after in the 1980s, and he's admitted unconscious because of a very low blood pressure. The sort of um, uh, toxins likely to be involved here, uh, starting, if, of course, if the heart, if the muscle pump, the heart itself is is damaged, that can cause a failure of circulation, particularly by phospholipase A2 myotoxins uh, attacking the heart muscle itself. Uh, there's one curious group of toxins called seraphotoxins found in Middle Eastern genus of uh, venomous snakes, genus Atractaspis or burrowing asps. Uh, these are very like physiological endothelins and cause uh, vasoconstriction or narrowing of the coronary arteries supplying the heart muscle. Clearly, that's going to also threaten the cardiovascular system. Probably the most common cause of shock or uh, cardiovascular failure in snake bite victims is a reduction in circulating blood volume. The technical term is hypovolemia. And this results from leakage of plasma and sometimes red blood cells as well, out of the bloodstream into the tissues. For example, in the very massively swollen limbs of uh, snake bite victims. And uh, the, the toxins likely to be involved here are those that damage the uh, endothelial lining of blood vessels and make them more permeable, more leaky. So um, uh, VEGF, for example, um, vascular endothelial growth factor, um, uh, metalloproteases in the venom, phospholipase A A2 and, and CRISP uh, toxins will all have this effect of making the blood vessels more leaky. And some toxins open up the um, systemic blood vessels, technical term vasodilatation, including the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, the bradykinin um, potentiating uh, peptides, kininogens, and atrial natriuretic peptides. And it's interesting to note, by the way, that these three sorts of toxins, the ACE inhibitors, the, the uh, uh, bradykinin potentiating peptides, and the atrial natriuretic peptides, have actually been harnessed um, as blueprints for drugs used to treat, uh, for example, high blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors are very widely used to control blood pressure in human patients. And this whole idea, this whole structure uh, was derived from the snake venom toxin. So you might say, well, snake venoms aren't entirely bad. They have been uh, put to very good use therapeutically for human disease. So a second group of uh, life-threatening problems in snake bite patients are bleeding 
blockage of arteries with clot and damage to small blood vessels. This shows a, a, one of the typical clinical signs uh, that of so-called hemostatic failure, uh, that is bleeding from the gums. And in this, in this boy, he's got bleeding into the skin and much more serious revealed by this um, a brain image shows bleeding into the brain, which of course is, is life-threatening. It's very often fatal. And this illustrates the damage to small blood vessels. These are cross sections of small arteries stained in various ways, showing the um, damage to the lining of the blood vessel and development of a, an occlusive plug or clot within the lumen of the blood vessel. So these are some of the toxins involved. First of all, a group of toxins that promote blood clotting, particularly serine proteases and um, metalloproteases. Then there are thrombin-like toxins, uh, which cause fibrin formation, and other toxins that break down fibrin and fibrinogen, the serine proteases again and the metalloproteases. Platelets are both activated and inhibited by a whole range of snake venom toxins, which I've listed here. And again, the damage to the blood vessel lining caused by metalloproteases, often zinc metalloproteases, uh, so these are metalloproteases, uh, disintegrins and C-type lectins. And finally, some snake venoms are anticoagulant in the way that heparin and uh, drugs like that are in, in human patients with thrombotic disorders. Now, a, a new group of um, lethal effects are paralysis. Uh, this young boy bitten by a crate in, uh, in Thailand, he was actually lying on the floor and bitten while he was asleep. I mentioned this earlier. And he developed progressive descending paralysis, starting with his eyelids, but eventually involving almost all his muscles, so that without this assisted mechanical ventilation, he would have died of respiratory failure. These are the mechanisms, and they're mainly targeted at the peripheral neuromuscular junctions, illustrated here. These are uh, striated muscle fibers. These are them, the muscle end plates, the neuromuscular junctions. And most of the paralyzing snake toxins act at these neuromuscular junctions. So a whole lot of different toxins, the presynaptic phospholipases A2, postsynaptic three-finger toxins, and uh, other toxins peculiar to uh, dendroaspis. These are mamba. Mamba venoms contain some very special additional neurotoxins, including ones that inhibits cholinesterase. And damage to muscle may also contribute to the weakness that ends up with a patient who cannot breathe, who has respiratory paralysis. Now, kidney damage, this lady in Myanmar has been bitten by a Russell's viper and she's got kidney failure and is being treated uh, by peritoneal dialysis, one of the forms of uh, renal replacement therapy, which will tide her over a period when her kidneys can't function adequately and uh, will allow her to survive. And here again, the toxins like to be involved. We know that there are some toxins which act directly on the renal tubule, the nephron. Um, others uh, cause kidney damage by um, producing clots in the small blood vessels in the kidney. Some constrict the renal arteries and some cause uh, kidney failure by lowering the blood pressure so that the um, perfusion of the kidney by uh, blood is inadequate. And finally, uh, toxins that damage muscle and break down red blood corpuscles uh, may produce pigments, hemoglobin, myoglobin, which can damage the kidney as well. Now, generalized breakdown of muscle, I mentioned already, so-called myotoxins, phospholipases A2 and uh, snake venom metalloproteases, uh, these will break down the skeletal muscle and release myoglobin into the circulation. And this will be passed in the urine. So this little girl in Sri Lanka, bitten by a Russell's viper, has got a massive breakdown of muscle. So she's passing almost black urine uh, loaded with, with myoglobin. 
And finally, local tissue necrosis. This shows the early sign that the snake venom has killed tissue, this pale area, which is also anesthetic and probably smells of decaying flesh, will slough off, will separate. And this is the ultimate appalling, appalling consequence of tissue necrosis in these two little boys I met in uh, Rio Blanco in Acre province in, um, in uh, Brazil, uh, both fishing, both bitten by um, Bothrops, Atrox snakes, uh, common lancehead snakes, and delayed arrival in hospital uh, when the gangrenous limbs caused by these um, uh, digestive toxins in snake venom uh, had caused such irreversible damage that all the doctors could do was to amputate the gangrenous limb. Really horrible. And these are the toxins likely to be involved, digestive phospholipase A2 myotoxins, attacking muscle, and uh, combined with uh, vascular endothelial damage from the metalloproteases, local thrombus, the site of the bite, um, particularly serine proteases. And sometimes the muscle swells, so you get mechanical pressure inside a tight fascial compartment. And finally, hyaluronidase is a common venom enzyme that promotes spreading of these toxins in the tissues, but can also contribute directly to, to uh, tissue necrosis. So they're the really horrible effects uh, of snake venoms in, in our human victims. That is the challenge facing uh, doctors and scientists trying to address this problem of snake bite envenoming. So the uh, only specific antidote we have at the moment is an ancient one. It was uh, developed at the end of the 19th century and um, it's called antivenom, which is a hyperimmune serum of an animal which has been immunized progressively with increasing doses of venom, of selected venoms. So here is the friendly and cooperative horse in a, um, an antivenom producer in Cairo in Egypt. And after a while, his, um, the, the horse's blood has a very high level of specific antibodies, which the horse's immune system has developed in response to the uh, immunized venoms. And the plasma is taken off, the red blood cells are returned to the horse. Um, and eventually, after a process of refinement, concentration, the antivenom or antiserum is administered intravenously to a patient with snake bite. Uh, we know that these conventional antivenoms are very effective in reversing cardiovascular um, uh, anti-hemostatic, that's bleeding and clotting effects, and paralysis caused by postsynaptic uh, neurotoxins. Um, this can be seen dramatically uh, at the bedside after treatment with antivenoms. Uh, however, uh, certain other effects of venoms are uh, really not reversible. Uh, if you give antivenom early enough after the bite, you can perhaps... And we found it was quite useful, and we left. I'm sorry? Hello. Sorry, I, think, I think one person uh, unmuted uh, herself for, for a second. Oh, I see. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I'd done something wrong. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, some of the effects of snake venoms are far less readily. Uh, they can't be reversed, certainly. But um, if you give antivenom early, uh, you can perhaps limit the effects. Uh, and finally, one of the problems with antivenoms is that they frequently cause adverse reactions such as anaphylaxis and serum sickness. So really, this is where we need help. Uh, we need innovation in the treatment of snake bite. And this is where uh, the role of science and technology comes in to this um, ancient problem of, of snakes biting people. Uh, we need to improve the design, the um, process of refinement and purification and concentration of conventional antivenoms. One clever idea is to use um, the, uh, um, rather than horses or sheep, to use camels, animals like alpacas and vincunias and yamas, and because they have a naturally occurring um, heavy chain uh, IgG 
uh, which is a single domain antibody. And this has great advantages because being a small molecule, it can penetrate tissues much more rapidly than the conventional um, a mixture of uh, heavy and light chains of the conventional IgG molecule. We can use, rather than whole venom, alternative substances to immunize the animal, such as synthetic peptides and so on. And um, the sciences of proteomics, which I've mentioned, and also antivenomics, which is a sort of immunodepletion technique that can predict in the laboratory how effective an antivenom will be. And finally, the development of monoclonal or oligoclonal antivenoms rather than the present uh, rather crude, you might say, polyclonal antivenoms. Then there are non-antibody uh, treatments, um, some of the ones I've listed here. Um, but I think the most exciting are those involving small molecule enzyme inhibitors. And here are three of the candidates. One is already in use. We're already using um, uh, en enzyme inhibitors of endogenous acetylcholinesterase in our patients, drugs like neostigmine. And they improve neuromuscular transmission by prolonging the biological life of acetylcholine, the uh, physiological uh, transmitter. Then you'll be hearing a lot about the rasplodib, which is a, an inhibitor of phospholipases A2, um, and also merimastat and related drugs, which inhibit snake venom metalloproteinases and might be very effective, for example, in preventing some of that horrible tissue necrosis that I've been showing you. Now on to prevention of snake bite and control. And there is a WHO program for this. Um, in 2017, uh, WHO finally restored snake bite to its list of, of uh, neglected tropical diseases, giving it category A priority. This was strongly supported a year later by the World Health Assembly resolution. And finally, in 2019, WHO published a roadmap, a strategy for prevention and control of snake bite. And this emphasizes, first of all, the numbers of patients uh, killed and permanently disabled. This is actually illustrated by one of my patients in Nigeria bitten by this black neck spitting cobra. Uh, she developed very severe local tissue necrosis. And even after surgery, she was left very severe, severely disabled by this um, hypertrophic scarring, so she required further surgery, just to emphasize the burden of morbidity. This is the WHO program, which uh, aims at reducing uh, death and disability from snake bite by 50% by the year 2030. So there's a pilot phase, a scale up phase, and a full rollout scale phase. This of course is going to be very expensive. The pilot phase alone will cost nearly nine million pound dollars. Um, the scale up phase, another more than 45 million US dollars. And finally, the full rollout, the massive $82 million. So this is going to need a lot of funding. So what about funding by um, philanthropic foundations? The Wellcome Trust of the United Kingdom has um, really given a marvelous example here, very generously uh, promising 80 million pounds over the next seven years to support research on snake bite, particularly development of new treatments. The Lillian Lincoln Foundation in the United States has put a lot of money into snake bite and was responsible for this brilliant uh, video movie uh, entitled uh, minutes to Die. I hope some of you have seen it, uh, emphasizing the, the, the horror of snake bite in rural communities, particularly in, in Kenya and India. The Hamish Ogston Foundation, I'm going to say a little about more in, in a moment. They are aiming at focusing particularly on clinical trials. And finally, the late Kofi Annan, who died um, very sadly in 2018, his foundation has given enormous moral support to the initiative in, uh, in support of snake bite. 
So now looking particularly at the, and ending with the um, contributions of the Hamish Ogston Foundation, which is a British-based charity founded by a very successful businessman, Hamish, Mr. Hamish Ogston. And its main donation so far has been towards clinical trials uh, in Myanmar, India, and, and Vietnam, uh, a total of 3.4 million pounds promised for this very neglected area of snake bite research. It's also supporting a DPhil fellowship in Myanmar, um, is providing small snake bite research grants to stimulate local people to uh, young career, early career researchers to go into to, to take up snake bite research. Uh, essay prizes, particularly looking at the impact of COVID-19 on snake bite research and treatment. The Hamish Ogston Foundation is the sole sponsor for the Oxford Venom and Toxins International Conference, which is where I met um, our chair lady in this meeting, uh, one of our two chair persons, uh, Andrea. And uh, finally, uh, most recently, the Hamish Ogston Foundation has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Hashu Foundation in uh, Pakistan uh, in favor of work on joint work on snake bite. Well, this is the program which I'm personally involved, that is a program of clinical trials of antivenoms and ancillary treatments for snake bite in these three countries which have a particular burden of snake bite. India, I've already told you about how the, the scale of the problem there, but also Myanmar and Vietnam illustrated here. And this program um, is focused on testing in clinical trials the safety, effectiveness, and the initial dosage of antivenoms and ancillary treatments in human snake bite victims. So thank you everyone for your attention. I hope that I've given you some idea of the background of snake bite and why it commands such an important position now amongst neglected tropical diseases, and particularly the role of people like the audience today, uh, young scientists in uh, developing new ideas to try and um, drag the treatment of snake bite uh, into the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Worrell. Always a pleasure listening to your presentations, uh, very uh, insightful. So I'll, if I, if I can, start uh, with a few questions and then I'll go into a few that we've got in the, in the chat. So when, we were, when you were explaining uh, how uh, systemic can be the damage that a snake bite envenomation patients can have, Every time and time I listen to, to, this, uh, to this explanation, it's always uh, striking because how is that uh, snake venom have evolved to tackle so many different aspects of uh, mammals, in our case, uh, humans' uh, biology? It's remarkable, isn't it? Yes, and it's a brilliant example, of course, of Darwinian evolution because uh, over millions of years, uh, snakes have survived only uh, by their ability to immobilize their prey. So the target, I should emphasize, the target of the evolution of snake venom toxins has not been humans. <laughs> they haven't evolved in this way to cause human beings, a bad, give them a bad time. It's been very much a matter of survival. And so over this long period of uh, history of snakes' evolution, They've been confronted in different environments by different types of prey, not just mammals. We think of snakes eating mice and rats, but they also eat a vast range of other um, creatures. Some of them actually eat eggs, uh, fish eggs, but most of them eat some sort of animal. And um, so the, the venoms have been evolved to deal with this. And that, that's the reason they're so specifically targeted on particular uh, physiological receptors. Uh, why they're so also why they are potentially of therapeutic interest in developing new drugs. So it's a sort of um, armament war, um, a development of effective armaments, so that the snake, which has no limbs, can effectively immobilize its natural prey. 
Um, makes sense. Uh, we have a few other questions here. Uh, we have one that says, do you know if there are any clinical trials about the therapeutics methods you mentioned? Uh, obviously, you elaborated a bit more on that towards the end of the talk. So perhaps it would be interesting to know um, what are the challenges uh, for antivenom clinical trials in comparison to a vaccine or a, a monoclonal antibody that goes uh, to target a different disease? Well, this is I'm, I'm very grateful for that question because this is the big problem uh, in snake bite that um, there's a brilliant achievement in laboratory toxinology, the science of venoms in the laboratory, and enormously uh, uh, um, brilliant richness of publications exploring all the some of the ideas I've mentioned today. So, for example, enzyme inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies, things like that. And um, frankly, clinical medicine just can't keep pace because it's very difficult to do clinical trials. Uh, first of all, you've got to find hospitals that are in, in the areas where snake bites occur, which tend to be um, in rural areas of tropical countries, if I may say tropical developing countries, or, or um, where, where there's a, there are various challenges to the health service and so on. And um, finding enough patients and um, finding people trained to carry out these trials. Um, so there are enormous difficulties, and this applies equally to um, conventional antivenoms, very few of which have been subjected to proper clinical testing for safety and effectiveness, but also to the new clever ideas. So we've got so many brilliant ideas that we'd love to test clinically, of course, it would have to be ethic. Uh, it would have to be done ethically. They would have to have reached a sufficient level of preclinical um, testing to be sure they were very unlikely to cause any harm and were very likely to cause benefit. But that is the bottleneck, uh, exactly. Um, and um, WHO, the WHO initiative is is desperately looking for um, places in the developing world. Uh, suitable for clinical trials. We've, uh, the Hamish Oxen Foundation has identified some brilliant sites in Myanmar, Vietnam, and India, but uh, Africa is, is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then let's move on to another one. So the question says, uh, why do you think snake bite and venom is lesser known among the general lay population and scientific community? And how do you think snake bite study will evolve in the future? Yeah, well, that's very perceptive. I and mean, this has been the disaster, you see, because snake bites happen to country people in rural areas, mainly um, agricultural workers and uh, these people, their problems, their medical problems are often poorly understood uh, by the Ministry of Health in the capital city. So it's a common experience of mine to visit a country and, for example, occasionally meet the Minister of Health who might not be aware that snake bite was a problem. And the sort of people who, are, who suffer from snake bite, who suffer death and permanent disability from snake bite, have a very poor political voice. Uh, they're not well connected. Their, their problem, their plight is not very well advertised to people of influence. And that has been the problem. Fortunately, that is now being reversed in many countries. There are some brilliant programs for um, uh, raising the profile of snake bite using um, media figures uh, and uh, um, sporting stars, film stars and so on. All the things that work for other diseases, have worked for other diseases, um, are now being uh, employed for snake bites. So I hope this, this will change. And also, um, snake bite is not really fashionable. It's, it's not something that can be easily, it can't be cured by vaccine, for example, unfortunately. If only we could develop vaccines and protect whole populations from snake bite, but that is, that is impossible. So, so there, there are some of the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and the very last question, I would say, uh, from more of a personal um, note, obviously you've traveled uh, around the world and meet uh, doctors, patients, 
uh, how can you describe your uh, experience from a personal perspective of uh, traveling and meeting all, all these people and, you know, contribute them in such an important way to what they've been uh, doing to help and tackling snake bite and venomation? Well, I feel enormously privileged, Andrea, because um, I suppose because I come from a, a, a Western university, um, I've been enabled through funding, through um, support of uh, international colleagues um, to visit many countries. I've had the enormous privilege of learning from local doctors, health workers, nurses, and most of all, I suppose, I've had the great privilege of of talking to snake bite patients, uh, having them as my patients, so that I was on the sort of relationship where they would explain to me what it was really like to be bitten by a snake and to begin to see the, all, the consequences, the economic consequences and the, the, the uh, psychological stress uh, resulting from this. So I just think I've been incredibly lucky. And of course, um, the aim is to, to hand over, to encourage local people to, to take up this interest. And what's been so rewarding for me in the countries where I've worked uh, many African countries, Asian, South American countries, is to see young doctors coming forward uh, enthusiastic to take up a disease that was not even mentioned in medical schools uh, when they were trained, perhaps. But they have this new enthusiasm to, to develop their own ideas. And this is reflected increasingly in international meetings now. We're not seeing a lot of uh, people like me, elderly um, elderly academics from Western countries, we're seeing young uh, clinical scientists from the countries directly involved by snakebite. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've uh, finished with uh, snakebite and venomation or finished uh, only so far. And now let's move to our very uh, last speaker. So this is uh, Carlos Garcia. He's going to talk us very briefly about the work he's been uh, doing in Universal Doctor. So Carlos Garcia uh, works as an innovation project manager for Universal uh, Doctor, a digital global health company who, or where they are helping developing apps that have been in use for the uh, WHO. So David, thank you very much for joining us. And the uh, floor is yours for this uh, very last couple of minutes uh, of our today's uh, webinar. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, before to proceed, can you see my screen, right? Perfectly. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much to, for my colleagues of uh, Innovation Forum Cambridge to give me the opportunity to talk here, and also for the other speakers for the, for the very interesting explanation of the, the situation of both diseases. I would like to close the event talking about um, how we can help to fight against the NTDs uh, using the, the innovation in digital health. This is an approach a bit different from the biological uh, sector, but I think that could be very interesting to implement this range of solution to fight against the entities. But uh, let's start from the beginning. I am Carlos Garcia Ramoseco. Uh, I am digital health passionate, and I started my adventure as, entrepre as entrepreneur in Aviona Health, in which we develop a uh, different uh, solutions to help a uh, cancer patient to fight against the secondary effects of the chemotherapy treatment. And after that, I continue working very closely with the innovation sector as a mentor in some different uh, digital health program and also in innovation forum, trying to help to the, to the startups to go to the next steps. And I continue my career as an innovation project manager in Universal Doctor a global digital health company with more than 10 years of experience uh, in where I have the opportunity to work very closely with the NTD's whole department, uh, developing different solutions uh, for NTD's. So what can digital health offer to fight NTD's? As you know, uh, the digital health sector is, is very big, has a lot of different uh, tools. But I would like to emphasize three, because I consider that the most important for this concrete topic. The data collection tools to obtain uh, valuable data from the field. The super decision tools, because sadly, as, as you know, 
the countries affected for this kind of diseases uh, has a lack of clinical and health resource. And of course, the health education, because the, uh, the education are probably the most important key feature to fight against whatever disease and the prevention. So as uh, Andrea commented before, we don't have a lot of time. So I would like to use a use case to try to explain more in deep and clearly these three concepts. So I would like to use this, the opportunity to, to explain to you the Skin Entities app, which is the app, one of the projects that we developed with the entity department. And this is project starts, uh, started as a digitalization of a training guide for frontline health workers, trying to help them to identify signs and symptoms of the different skin entities. So we can consider that this project born as a health education tool, because there we have, well, we offer to the healthcare worker in the field information about the different, a description of the different skin entities, location, giving information or maps about the number of uh, the number of cases of the different countries affected for the diseases, pictures to help in the identification of the diseases, and also a small diagnostic tool to help the healthcare worker in the field to recognize the different skin skin things between the different entities and also with uh, skin common diseases. But we continue growing the tool and our next step now is try to become this, this educational tool in a data collection tool. Oh, we want to offer to healthcare workers in the field the opportunity to take pictures and report cases and this information sent to WHO and the people from WHO can analyze this information and create a repository of data with the pictures and the cases. So what we, what we can do with that information? The final step is become this tool using the power of uh, artificial intelligence to create algorithms to help in the identification and, the, and the diagnosis of the different skin entities. I mean, the people of the, the healthcare workers in the field can take pictures of their patients and the apps help to them to identify the, the possibilities of the, of the diagnosis. So as you can see here in the same tool, we, have, we can have different kind of solution to help in the fighting and the entities. So what can we learn from this example? For me, it's very important to explain to you that this kind of solution usually, for example, are apps. It means that are very accessible for the general population and the healthcare workers because, because uh, sadly in, in some countries affected for these diseases, it's more easy to have a phone than on fresh water. And for this reason, are very spread around. It's very easy to spread around the world this solution. And for me, the key point of this kind of solution are that are very adaptable and update and update in the in the in the time. Yeah. What it means? It means that we can collect feedback feedback from the from the field and adapt the tool to the necessities in real time of the healthcare workers. So, as you know. For the guilty of the coronavirus, the, the digital health, health sector is growing a lot. And I think that it's a very great opportunity that some institution as WHO uh, are detecting to create a very scope of different solutions based on, or based on digital health to fight or help against the, against the entities. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I really expect that you enjoy the presentation. And this is my contact information. If you want to, now you can do question, but if you want clarification, whatever you want, uh, you can contact me. And that's it. Thank you very much, Carlos. Very uh, quick, but equally very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, I'm curious to know, what's the source that you have identified to collect the data to uh, build the app on? Because obviously, in some of these cases, uh, were well, in particular to the case to uh, neglected tropical diseases, data collection is difficult because sources are not uh, necessarily uh, readily available. So, what have you been using to uh, to get this data from? Um, it's a, it's a this is a good question, and it's very curious because uh, in this kind of countries, 
uh, the number of phones that people has are very high. So this is a good starting point to start collecting data. And we want to specialize uh, to, to, I mean, our main target usually is the, is the healthcare worker. So we, our aim is help them to do that, to, to, to give, give tools to them and obtain data from them. But as I told you, uh, it's very common that uh, the population has phones. So for, for this reason, I commented before that uh, this kind of solution are very helpful in this kind of countries. Okay. Um, we have another question from the chat. It says, uh, thanks, Carlos. Do you have any advice for future entrepreneurs? What are the key ingredients to your success? Okay. Um, uh, yes. Um, well, um, I think that the key of uh, to to work, especially not not as an entrep general entrepreneur, I would like to to use the perspective of the gen of the healthcare entrepreneur, is uh, try always to obtain as much partners as possible. It's very important uh, because I, for example, I'm not from the healthcare sector. So for, for, for what I'm entrepreneur in terms of digital health, it's very important to help very closely with the doctors to, to understand very well their necessities. Because it's a very, I think that is the, the most hard, the hardest field to, to try to, to, to do an entrepreneurship because, uh, well, we are, we are working with the most important thing in the world, which is the health of the people. So the legislation is, is, is very hard. So always try to, to, to collaborate and with, 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 with the most, with as much as possible with the, with the health sector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Carlos, uh, thank you very much. And on that note, I would like to uh, thank you personally, but also from uh, Innovation Forum to Professor uh, David Heyman, uh, Professor David Worrell, and of course to you, Carlos, for your uh, excellent presentations, uh, all of them very insightful and I think also very inspiring. We've all uh, taken, a, I'm sure, a few notes, uh, at least uh, food for thought, uh, to say the least. So on that note, I would like to invite you to uh, come to our uh, next uh, Innovation Forum webinar, which will be uh, next Thursday, and it'll be on intellectual property IP for uh, startups. And we'll, be, we'll have the, the opportunity to discuss with uh, Mark and Clerk uh, what are the challenges and what are the resources that entrepreneurs uh, have uh, their uh, availability when they want to start uh, startups or simply uh, new endeavors. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and hopefully uh, see you next week. Mm -hmm.